the chairperson for this session, Jane Hill. Thank you. Libraries essential for learning, essential for life. It's my great pleasure to introduce Molly Raphael, the current president of the American Library Association. ALA was established in 1876 and has nearly 61,000 members. Molly has been active in ALA and held many roles. She was awarded the Arthur Fleming Civil Rights Award and in 2009, the USA's highest honor for museum and libraries, the US Institute for Museum and Library Services National Medal for Museum and Library Service. Molly has been working in urban public libraries for 40 years, including in Washington, DC, and in Oregon. And it is with great pleasure that I ask you to join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, it's delightful to be here. Thank you very much, Jane. This has been a wonderful opening experience for me. I have at the top of my page, Kia Ora, and I also have tried to learn how to pronounce the theme of the conference because I love what the theme says about what libraries are. So bear with me as I say it. Te ihi, te wehi, te wana. Passion, people, and power. What wonderful words to describe libraries. I'm delighted to be here with you, um, not just because this is a conference of librarians, but uh, this is my first visit to your spectacular country, and I know I will be back many more times, um, but I, in the few days that I've been here, I've already enjoyed such a wonderful visit that I know that I will go back with wonderful stories to tell, so thank you so much for um, inviting me to be here and share some time with you. I have to say I sat in um, Martin Malloy's um, um, presentation and I kept hearing words and phrases that were ones that I've heard so many times in the United States. So you may hear some of those same words and phrases. Uh, he said something near the end that I think he had touched on uh, throughout the speech, but it, it resonated with me because it's so important for how I view libraries and um, how libraries can be relevant and successful in the future. And that is focus on local needs, but then collaborate with other entities to help meet those needs. So my talk today is entitled Libraries Essential for Learning, Essential for Life. And I chose this title because of my deep belief in the value of libraries of all types and the essential and transformative role that libraries can and must play in the lives of individuals and communities. We are living in quite extraordinary times. Throughout the library world, not just in the United States, but also all across the globe, 
reductions in financial resources threaten our survival. At the same time, many libraries, in fact most libraries that I know of, are experiencing large increases in demand and use as people turn to libraries for helping, finding, helping to find employment, for retooling for new careers, for improving their 21st century literacy skills, and so much more. In academic, public, school, and special libraries, these challenges really call for innovative thinking and forward-looking solutions. In the 1990s, when the internet really took off, many pundits, at least in the United States where I was reading, uh, who really didn't understand what the core of a library is, suggested that libraries were going to fade away as the internet became more and more prominent. Libraries, they believed, were simply storehouses of books and other resources that would be made obsolete by the internet. But instead of fading away, libraries embraced the internet. Libraries demonstrated once again how adaptable we could be in meeting the needs of the communities we served. Now we find ourselves in an environment where if we don't change, and change rapidly, if we like the way we are and just want to decide to stay where we are, we will find ourselves sitting by the roadside as the world passes us by. I believed in the 1990s, and I'm even more convinced today, that the best way for us to ensure the future of all types of libraries is to demonstrate unequivocally that libraries are as essential as any of the services that we hear described that way by decision makers and elected officials. As a public librarian in the United States for 40 years, I grew somewhat weary of hearing certain local services like the police and fire departments described as essential, while libraries were described as discretionary. When I talked to my colleagues in the who were serving in school libraries, they told me that the word that their administrators used were ancillary rather than discretionary. No matter what the name, the message and meaning are clear. We just aren't as important as some other services in the communities we serve. I strongly disagree with this assessment, no matter what the library, but I do agree that we have not been as effective in making our case as we need to be. In order not to just survive, but to thrive, we must not only transform our libraries, but we must also transform how people think about us. How can we shift that thinking so that rather than being seen as nice to have, we're seen as essential. First, I think we who lead and work in libraries need to listen to the people in our communities. Our services must reflect what our communities value and how we can contribute to their advancement. And we need to be willing to take bold steps, to make difficult choices about what we can and cannot do. Second, I think we need to build on the studies and research that demonstrate the value of libraries, all types of libraries. And third, and this is the place that I'm really investing my work within the American Library Association, we need to rally our communities, our library users, to tell our story, the story of the transformational power of libraries. So first, how do we keep our libraries moving forward? The rapidly changing world in which we live challenges us to keep up, not to stay comfortable where we are and safe, but to look for opportunities about how to deliver services in new ways. By and large, I think libraries are doing remarkably well in this area. When I'm thinking not just about changes in technology and keeping up with changes in technology, but how we communicate with our publics and, and really looking at how our public is not just the local community, but the wider community that has access to us now because of um, technology. And I'm also thinking about, and this is a particularly um, important issue in the United States, the demographic changes that are cha happening in our um, communities, 
populations are becoming much more diverse, and as our po local populations become more diverse, we have to be better at figuring out how to collect, connect local library services with those populations. When I visit libraries around the country, and actually I've started visiting some here in New Zealand, and I also look at library websites, I'm excited by what I see. I've just begun my trip here in New Zealand, so I'm just beginning to learn about the issues and challenges that you face, um, but I know you must be addressing many of the issues that we are in the United States. And I think we have great opportunities to learn from each other. This is a really exciting time to be working in libraries as we try to balance the demand for the traditional services that we've offered with the increasing demand for digital services. And again, the previous speaker talked some about that, uh, what's happening when you start offering uh, e-books and, and loans um, in digital resources. But by paying attention to uh, and listening to our diverse communities, we can make decisions that bring in new patrons as well as continue to serve those who have valued and supported us for many years. There's a recent study that was uh, issued by the American Library Association's Office for Information Technology Policy called Confronting the Future, Strategic Visions for the 21st Century Public Library. This is authored by OITP fellow Roger E. Levine. It's available on ALA's website. Um, it, and it lays out dimensions of strategic choices that libraries are facing now and that will have a big impact in the future in terms of how well libraries are able to serve their communities. So if you think of these as dimensions and then try to think some about where is your library uh, along those dimensions. So the first one that um, Roger Levine identified uh, was, is the physical library versus the virtual library. Most libraries are not at the extremes of, these of this continuum. There's some place in the middle, and probably most of us are a little closer to the physical end than we are to the virtual end. Um, if you think about this, think about not just physical library buildings, but also physical materials. We make strategic choices about where we invest and how we invest that are going to have a profound impact on, on, li on the, our libraries in the future. So uh, we see uh, how libraries allocate resources and how much they sh are shifting resources to virtual uh, resources rather than to physical resources. And the p uh, opportunities that this creates really to serve rural populations, which is an area that um, there are many parts of the United States that would be much too far from a library to, to get to a library on a regular basis. But now that we can de deliver so much of our services virtually, they have opportunities to um, uh, benefit much more. Um, even with um, social networking and the expectations we have about what social networking is going to look like even a year down the road, let alone five years around, down the road, we see that there is still a lot of demand for face-to-face. -face. So we keep being pulled back some in the physical direction as well as the virtual direction. The second di dimension is, um, relates to the user, and it's whether you focus on the individual user or the community. So again, think of how your libraries are set up to focus, to serve individual users. That's what we've done really well, I think, in libraries for a long time. That's where we invest our resources with reference librarians. That's connecting the individual with the information that he or she needs for whatever purpose. But we're seeing a lot of focus on the community. So how do we deliver services that are community focused? How do we use programming to um, deliver um, learning opportunities for our community? How do we bring people together to discuss issues of importance in the community in our library? And how do we create the spaces to make that possible so that it's not all spaces focused on individual users? The third dimension is the collection library versus the creative library. This is an area where I think in the United States, and I don't know enough about New Zealand libraries yet, I haven't visited you enough to, to make this judgment, 
but I think we're really much more focused on the collection side. Uh, but we have some great examples in the world of um, libraries that have really started focusing on creativity and the creative side. Places like the Netherlands, Denmark, Scandinavia, Singapore, Hong Kong, new libraries that are, are um, having spaces, equipment, and programs that bring people, creative people, together to create and add to the knowledge that we have. And then the fourth dimension is the portal library versus the archival library. So again, think about your own library and where it is on, on developing itself as a portal to um, knowledge and resources uh, versus actually having the materials within the physical space, within the walls, so that people um, know that you have something locally. This is a really important area, again, for how we serve our dispersed populations. It's also a great way for us to be able to provide services to um, in different language communities, for instance, because we can do that through the portal that we may have um, uh, to deliver those services. So I think this is really important to sort of think about how, what direction are we moving and what does this mean for the future? Certainly uh, local history, um, special collections that libraries have, those are much more likely to stay in the archival library, but perhaps be made available on a uh, portal uh, much more widely through digitization. So the second area that I talked about at the beginning when I was talking about the three different steps was the area that I think we need to pay attention to is the research in the, on the value of libraries. I'm going to give you just a few examples. These are not necessarily the most scholarly research pieces that have been done, but they are um, pieces of research that are really helpful in informing us about how we talk about libraries. So um, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, the Knight Commission, uh, which is a, um, a commission that's connected to journalism primarily in the United States, published something called Informing Communities, Sustaining Democracies in a Digital Age. And this really articulates a vision for community information needs and the critical steps that are necessary in order to meet that, those needs. The report offers a very clear place where libraries can contribute to the vision of informed communities as described in this document. Second example that's been widely used in the United States, and I'm assuming that um, since o OCLC is um, all over the world, that um, you're aware of this as well, is a, a study called From Awareness to Funding, which looked at how, what actually affected voters in the United States in supporting public library funding initiatives. Many of the public libraries in the United States can go directly to voters for increasing their support. So if you're in a community where that's possible, how do you figure out how to reach voters who would be, um, and get them to vote yes on those initiatives? The first um, finding was that library funding support, in other words, people who would vote yes to increase funding for libraries, was only marginally related to library visitations. So if the only people we're talking to are the people who are coming into our libraries, we're missing a huge audience who are people who really believe in the value of public libraries even if they aren't using them. The second finding was that perceptions of librarians, and frankly, most people think everyone who works in a library is a librarian, so I often said to my staff, when you hear that about librarians, don't think it's only the people who have the degrees. It's any, the public sees it as anyone who's working in a library. The perception of librarians is an important predictor of library funding support. This is a really important issue in the United States because government, trust in government, you probably have read about it, is like at an incredible all-time low. We are, government workers are sort of the worst profession that you can possibly have. But in the United States, many, many people, even though they know libraries are government-run institutions, they don't put us in that category. They love the librarians. They love the staff of the people where they go into the libraries. So recognize that and use it to your advantage. 
when I was working for a funding levy in Multnomah County, which is in Portland, Oregon, I read this and I thought, hmm, when I go out and speak to community groups, instead of introducing myself as the director of the Multnomah County Library, I'm going to introduce myself as the chief librarian for Multnomah County. Just, again, picking up on words that were important to people. The third finding was that voters who saw the library as transformational, as a transformational force in their lives and in their communities, as opposed to an informational source, were much more likely to increase taxes in, and in support of that library. So those are sort of three examples of things that we can learn and then apply in our own environments. In academic libraries, uh, an important review of research was published by ALA's Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, and this was within the last year, called The Value of Academic Libraries, a Comprehensive Research Review and Report. This report actually looked at how libraries, academic libraries, were measuring their value to their um, universities and colleges. And ACRL is now in a second phase of helping to gather this information about how to measure the contributions of academic libraries to the communities they serve, so that that will be available um, to people who are trying to figure out how to do that within their own academic institutions. In school libraries, an example of the type of research that I'm talking about is um, the work that's been done by um, Keith Curry Lance, who's from Colorado. He's been doing work on studying the impact of school libraries and school librarians on student performance, actually making that connection of the value of a school librarian to student performance in the school. He's actually been um, uh, hired to do this in a number of states, do studies within the states, and then those states are using that information to help um, get, uh, continue to get funding for um, school libraries. Uh, and he's continuing to, um, to, to do this. I just um, heard him recently, and he was doing it for a couple of more states. So what much of this research is doing is really looking at Outcomes, and again, I previous Mr. Malloy, say you you talked about outcomes for libraries. You know, for many years, at least when I started my career, uh, what we cared about were inputs, like how many books did we have per capita in our library. Then we said, oh, that's not what people are really interested. What they want to know is how much is the library used. So then we started um, collecting outputs. We started looking at how many books did we circulate in the library. Now, I think we are finally paying attention to what really matters to people. What's the impact of what we do, no matter what type of library we're in? How do we really transform lives? For example, what's the effect of a summer reading program on children's reading levels in the community? Or how does an academic library actually contribute to student learning or attracting research funding to that academic institution? Or what's the impact of the information literacy instruction in school libraries on student achievement in those schools? Outcome data are much more difficult to collect, but they do have a much greater impact on decision makers. As practitioners, I think we can be more effective in our advocacy work if we can use these research results when we make the case for the value of libraries. When we couple this research with the economic threats to libraries and the way that people have fought back, not just in the United States, but in the UK, which I've been reading about, and I think as the threats come around to um, different places, it becomes really clear that while this is a frightening time in some ways for public libraries and for libraries in general, it's also a golden opportunity for us to demonstrate the critical roles libraries play in learning and throughout our lives. I want to digress just a minute before I start my next point to tell you just a little bit about how public libraries are funded in the United States because I think it's quite different um, from what you might assume. It depends what state you're in. The envy of um, all the states is Ohio. Ohio has a set-aside amount that comes from the state that goes to every local community. 
So every place in Ohio has access to public library service and a uh, funding that supports it that has been the envy of the rest of us across the country. In addition to that, Ohio libraries can go to the voters and ask for a levy on top of that. And many, many of them do, and many of them have done that in the last year or two during this economic downturn. It's been remarkable how many funding measures have passed. 80, I think it's 87% of the public library funding measures that have been on the ballot in 2010 passed. And when you think about people voting in their local communities to tax themselves more, that is a huge vote of confidence for um, libraries in their community. So that's Ohio. Then I'll take the state that's just north of where I live, Washington State. Washington State divided the state up into library districts. And so every part of the state is actually covered by a public library. That funding, is a, that district funding, comes from a standalone tax that um, people in the community set up. And the state um, library, the library districts can go back to those states, I mean, go back to the voters and ask to increase that amount. The third type example I'm going to give is my own state of Oregon. So Oregon has library districts that are self-taxing districts. So the library actually collects the tax, holds the tax, and, and uses the tax, and it can't be used for anything else except the library. I worked for a library system that was a county library system that had money that came from the county's general fund, in other words, from the county government, the elected officials in the county government, but also from a library levy. And the library levy had to be voted on every five years. So two-thirds of our budget every year, all the staff who worked in the library would have white knuckles because they were so worried about whether the library would be funded or not. And the voters continually supported those libraries. Other libraries um, uh, get a combination of funding, and some places don't have libraries at all. So there are some places that aren't paying any taxes for libraries, and they don't get any library service whatsoever. They're small, but there still are some. So think about that when I talk about some of these things about libraries, that it's very different in the United States. Well, as I say to people, we have to look at the actual local level to see what the funding is like. So then the third point that I was, um, wanted to make in this presentation uh, is in the area that my um, presidential initiative, my ALA presidential initiative, is who can be the most effective in telling the library story? When we who work in libraries tell our story, what is really the story of the library, there is almost always a perceived element of self-interest. People who think libraries are not important simply say that we are just trying to protect our jobs. When members of our communities tell the story of the transformational power of libraries, that self-interest issue just totally disappears. As a public librarian, I frequently witness the power of people from our community telling our story. I would often meet with elected officials and community leaders, and yes, as a public library director, if you aren't political, you are not going to get your libraries funded in the United States. But I would meet with these leaders, and I'd talk about their programs, and I'd talk about the value and the outcomes that we were producing. In tough economic times, I knew that those individuals struggled with how to make the best decisions that they could, including officials whom I knew valued library services and really wanted to support libraries. But what I saw time and time again was the profound impact that a parent or a teacher or a business leader or a community activist could have in making the case for us. For example, I witnessed the father of a third grader who was telling the city council about how his son, who had been a reluctant reader and had fallen behind in grade level in school, he talked about the importance of the public library's summer reading program and how it turned his son into a reader and that his son now loved to read and was doing very well in school. The power of others telling our story has been known to us for a while, particularly, I think, in the public library world as we've had these opportunities at public hearings to have the public testify for us. I want to give you another example because the power of this story just blew me away when I read it. I did an interview on National Public Radio um, as ALA president for 
uh, um, the national public radio station in um, San Francisco, California. And there's a lot of um, um, stories in the press about what might be happening to the Oakland Public Library right across the bay from San Francisco. Uh, one of the proposals would have closed a half of the branch libraries in Oakland. And the community really organized and um, turned that situation around. But after this half hour program aired about the, um, uh, what was going on in funding in libraries and what citizens were doing, someone posted a response to the story on the NPR website. And I'm going to read it to you because I think it, it illustrates the power that I'm talking about, about others telling our story. Quote, my educational journey began in a public library. In the early 90s, as the result of mistakes I made in my life, I was unemployed and homeless in Tucson, Arizona. However, I found a second chance at education by going to the public library. I could check out textbooks in math and chemistry, and in spite of being a high school dropout, was able to teach myself algebra, geometry, chemistry, and high school physics. The librarians were very helpful when they discovered what I was doing and suggested books that would be helpful. After a year of this, I was able to get into a community college and from there went on to earn my engineering degree at a four-year university. I now have my master's in science in engineering. None, all capital letters, of this would have happened without the public library. Libraries are not just needed for children but also for adults. Who knows where I would be now without the library? I owe my education, my career, and what I have achieved to the public library. To reduce or even eliminate access to libraries is short-sighted, mean-spirited, and just plain dumb. Thank you, public library." End quote. The power of that story told by that individual is so much greater than in the impact it can have on an elected official and community leaders than my telling the story. In the OCLC report from Awareness to Funding that I mentioned e earlier, it noted that when libraries were seen as a transformational force rather than an informational source, that they received much stronger support. As librarians and library workers, I think we can help people find the words that describe that transformational experience, the outcomes that made differences in those individuals' lives. I've been heartened to see other um, similar situations in other types of libraries. In school libraries, the most widely publicized report on this was um, in the United States of community members actually speaking out, rather than the school librarians advocating for their own libraries, took place in Spokane, Washington. There, three mothers, who became known as the Spokane Moms, spoke out and made a real difference. Even when they lost an important vote at the local school district level, they decided to go fight for legislation at the state government level. They thought it was so important for students all across the state to have equal access to schools, librarians, staffed by certified school librarians. Their persistence was pretty amazing, and in the end, it paid off at the state level in providing support for school libraries and school librarians. Keith Curry Lance, who I mentioned earlier, who's been doing the research on school libraries, summed up the impact this way, quote, Five minutes of parent advocacy for school libraries can have more effect than five years of what might appear as self-serving advocacy." End quote. While there have been some efforts to replicate this effort, uh, advocacy effort in um, Washington State and elsewhere around the United States, we still don't seem to be able to figure out how to learn the lesson um, about how to do this. We really need to be better at engaging our communities and then helping empower them to speak. The report that I mentioned earlier on the value of academic libraries provides ways to talk about academic libraries. A story that caught my eye um, last year was um, at the University of California at Berkeley, where several hundred students took over the anthropology library for 24 hours to protest cuts in library hours. 
Uh, it appeared to some that the libraries didn't need to be opened over the weekend and the university had decided that they would close down some of these departmental libraries and the students made it very clear that they needed those libraries and they needed them over the weekend. As one who came of age in the 1960s in the United States and saw the impact of nonviolent civil rights protests, I remember how powerful those mass demonstrations can be. Those students at UC Berkeley, a really important constituency of that library, were saying to the funders that libraries really do matter. So my challenge to you today is to think about how our library communities can speak in powerful ways for our libraries. How can we find ways to direct this kind of advocacy, if you will, by library users to say that libraries make a difference to the people who are actually making decisions about the future of libraries, including funding decisions. As a profession, I also think we need to think of another important consideration about how we advocate. We seem to advocate only when budgets get cut and when times are tough. We need to find ways to have our communities talk about the value of libraries year in and year out, not just in tough economic times. This is not saying that we should be talking about budgets all the time, but it is saying that we need to have people talk about libraries and student achievement, or about summer reading programs and the way they result in children and youth maintaining reading levels over what is a very long summer break in the United States for students or how student success in higher education as an outcome has a direct link to academic libraries. If we can move ourselves into that essential service category, like police and fire, then we start from a very different place when tough economic times come. We still have to work hard, but we are standing in a better place. So how do we connect this important research that is being done on the value of libraries and their transformative power in our communities with the advocates who can speak powerfully and effectively about our libraries, more so than we can. I don't think we have all the answers. I think there's still a lot to learn, and I hope to learn from you during the time I'm here um, for this conference. But I do think we're asking the right questions. We are a smart, committed profession. We are a generous profession that really believes in sharing and replicating successes. We see this in the way libraries replicate successful new services of other libraries. We have many library supporters already who are passionate about the value of libraries. 